Welcome to the first lesson on trees, the theory of inventive problem solving. The lesson is subtitled Invention on Demand, and that's to convey the important concept that problem solving does not necessarily occur by some act of brilliance or a lightning bolt, but actually can be summoned at will using a set of rules and procedures. Today I'd like to present to you two very powerful concepts of trees, not necessarily in the same order, as the reading assignment, but in an order that makes a little more sense to me. They are ideality and resources, and then parenthetically what I call enabling technologies, a close cousin of resources. Okay, let's begin. I'm sure that you've all had this experience of encountering a product or a gadget that is absolutely brilliant, that you look at it and you say, why didn't I think of that? It's obvious. Well, if it was that obvious, then why didn't you think of it? And why didn't someone else think of it? Here's a, a perfect illustration. This is what they call the TikTok lunatic uh, watch that is nothing but a wristband that accommodates the iPod Nano and converts it into a really cool multi-touch watch. You see that it was uh, uploaded to Kickstarter with a goal of raising $15,000 and they wind up raising nearly a million dollars which is an illustration that it was a, uh, an idea or a product or a problem that was just waiting to happen and if you had just come along a little bit sooner applied principles let's say of trees you may have come up with this the same invention the software we're going to use in this class is offered by Ideation International it involves a number of different modules or um, utilities. The one that we're going to focus on the most is Innovation Workbench. But uh, the company, namely Zion Bar L, their president, is making all of these available to you uh, should you be interested. It's founded on a theory that's actually very old that was developed around the Second World War by a Russian inventor. TREES is actually an acronym, and it's uh, a Russian acronym. It stands for Theory of Inventive Problem Solving. The inventor is Genrik Altschuler. In the um, uh, accompanying videos, you'll see some original lectures of Altschuler, and you'll, you'll get an idea of um, um, the origins of, uh, of this theory that he developed. It's a systematic, structured way of thinking. It's, um, you could say, a science that not only studies how inventions are made, but studies patterns of evolution. And it harnesses those patterns to kind of predict the future or predict the next generation of a product. You could say it's a result of 55 years of research analyzing a, a large repository of patents, three million patents which were present at the time that he um, developed the theory and um, represent a, a very rich and broad set of um, principles that are made um, somewhat universal. So at this point I'd like you to just to take a little break from the uh, PowerPoint lecture and click on this very short video that comes from the University of Bath. Um, it's related to this company called BioTrees, and it just, it's a very nice, quick um, introduction into trees. And then come back to the PowerPoint. Presuming that you've seen the video, welcome back. I just want to summarize a, a, a couple of things. One has to do with Al Schuller, the founder of Trees, who um, developed the, the principles uh, around the, the Second World War, 1946. He was born in the Soviet Union. Um, he was a very creative inventor himself, and therefore understood the, uh, what he was talking about, the principles of, um, of what made an inventor uh, productive and successful. He was a, both a mechanical and chemical engineer, and I think that comes across in many of the components of the, of the theory, as you'll see as we learn uh, many of the, of the tools. 
He started working on trees in 1946, which I believe was in the video, uh, describes um, his um, involvement in the Navy during the Second World War. And he's published quite prolifically, 14 books, numerous papers. He's taught thousands of students. And for a long time, it was just locked up um, behind the Iron Curtain. What uh, subsequently happened is, is Zion Bar L, the president of Ideation International, basically uh, bought a university in the um, former Soviet Union and imported those experts to the United States. And it's from there that he started his company, Ideation International, with the disciples of Altshuler. One of the important underlying theories or principles or, or underpinnings of trees is that inventions follow a certain pattern. So he recognized that the same fundamental problems, also known as contradictions, They've been addressed over and over again by a number of inventions in a similar way, but in different areas of technology. He also observed that the same fundamental solutions were used over and over again, often separated by many years. So he reasoned that if the latter innovator had the knowledge of the earlier solution, their task would have been much more easy. I'm sure you've had the same experience of solving one problem based on an analogy with a previous solution to a, a similar or a, a, um, a problem that resembles your current problem. He systematized that, that uh, practice. So he sought to extract and compile and organize this information, this set of problems and corresponding solutions. So this slide kind of illustrates the process that he went through. He analyzed about 3 million worldwide patents, out of which he extracted what he considered to be truly inventive patents. From those inventive patents, he, he divined or identified patterns, so uh, developed definitions of invention, identified levels of inventions, and then these patterns of evolution and patterns of invention. Then he sought to provide principles by which those same patterns could be transferable and generalized so that they could be used on any problem. So in other words, you have a new problem that's presented to you. It is then de decomposed into a set of sub-problems or uh, as we learn um, in the near future, contradictions. You apply the corresponding solution based on the historical pattern of, of solution to problems from the patent literature. And then you can apply that set of solutions in an analogous way to create a solution for your problem. Large number of typical problems are available for consideration and trees helps narrow them down because there, there is quite an abundance of them to a manageable range of typical problems. For each typical problem, there is one or more potential solutions, of course. So now it's up to the, the human inventor to uh, take it to the... One of the fundamental tenets of trees is that innovation is a core competency. It is a skill that has a value to your company, to your enterprise, to your life. You think in terms of, of uh, cash flow of a product, for example. Some point in time, there is an opportunity that occurs. It's some time later that the opportunity is perceived. Shortening that window is part of the, of the formula for success, getting there first or recognizing that need first. At some later point in time, investment has been uh, collected so as to begin doing something about the problem or the opportunity and to begin a development project. At some later point in time and, and minimal amount of investment, the product definitions and the plans freeze. 
Thereafter, product is released to production and there are initial sales. And by the time first customers are satisfied, there should be some positive cash flow. But at some later point in time, it was what's called a break even, where the investment equals the, uh, the payback. And then not every product exists forever. Uh, everything has a finite lifetime. So the product eventually disappears and replaced by the next generation of product. So obviously, when you look at this diagram, the way to make the most bang for the buck or the, the greatest reward for the investment is to shorten and accelerate the innovation cycle and to lengthen the period of time over which the, the product or project or solution is valuable. This is illustrated in a similar way in this diagram produced by my colleague in the Mechie department, Dr. John Kagan. His student did her thesis on the study of how to categorize patents. In this particular study, she took 100 related patents from the U.S. Patent Trademark Office and clustered them based on their underlying theme. For the purpose of this illustration, it's not really important what patents these are. I just want to illustrate the concept of clumping versus divergent thinking. For example, all the patents in this first clump are variations on a similar theme. In terms of levels of invention, you might say that each additional patent would score lower than the previous. In other words, it would be more obvious as more examples are introduced. If you were responsible for, say, adding this one new patent, you might be guilty of intellectual inertia. If, on the other hand, you are responsible for looking in a completely different direction, then you should be commended for overcoming psychological inertia. According to Altshuler, some directions are better than others. This is because they point in the direction that the system or the technology must naturally evolve. When we get to the topic of directed evolution, you will learn that some techniques will steer you into the correct direction that will lead to the, the most innovative futuristic dimension of that technology. And that is our objective. Okay, I would like to return now to the main subject of this lecture, the fundamental concepts of trees. There are three really important concepts, ideality, resources, and a third one which I hadn't mentioned, contradictions. I'm mentioning it here because I want them to be all in one place and that you remember them um, as kind of a, a package triumvirate of trees concepts. But we'll be getting to contradictions next week. Today we're going to focus on ideality and resources. Okay, let's get started with your first principle of trees, known as ideality. It's part of the very foundation of trees, and it's based on the tenet that all systems involve useful and harmful functions. Now, this might seem at first blush to be an obvious statement, almost trite, but it is actually very powerful because it's easily and commonly overlooked when solving problems as we will see in a moment. When we say useful, we're talking about features or properties of a system that maximize pleasure, that makes you happy or makes your customer happy, or features that will minimize or mitigate pain. We know with every useful function, they come at a cost. These are the harmful functions. They might be the expense, the fact that they occupy space, they produce waste, they make noise, they consume energy, they require uh, resources or maintenance, or any number of new problems that they create. So this definition of ideality is basically the ratio 
of the useful functions or effects to the harmful functions or effects, which is also known in, let's say, the business world as the cost-benefit ratio or the benefit-cost ratio. Okay, let's take one example, the automobile, one of the greatest inventions of the modern era and which has undeniably shaped modern society. It has brought us many benefits. I don't need to enumerate them. You know what they are. But they've come at a cost. There's the financial burden that it puts upon each of us. It has caused shifts in society, such as suburban sprawl and pollution. There are um, uh, unfortunate accidents that are as a result of the automobile. There's drunk drivers. There's secondary consequences, such as the trade deficit due to our dependence on foreign oil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm sure that the inventors of the automobile never really contemplated the, um, the negative consequences. But here we are, we have an invention that brings us a lot of good things and hence uh, opportunities to um, improve ideality by mitigating the bad things. Having now the definition of ideality, now we can define invention as anything that improves ideality. That means either improving the useful functions or effects, reducing the harmful effects, or doing both. And our objective as inventors or engineers is always to optimize or increase or maximize ideality. Ideally, to obtain the useful effect without even creating a harmful effect. That's the ultimate invention. For example, an automobile that doesn't consume fossil fuel, an adhesive that does not bond permanently, a sweetener that does not contain calories. Returning to the example of the automobile, if I wanted to invent a better automobile, I would look at the ideality. In this particular case, the useful function of providing mobility against the harmful function of using a lot of gas. You could say I could reduce the use of gas by simply not driving as much. But that doesn't really invent anything. That's not really improving ideality. That's a compromise. If I can somehow drive more and use less gas, well, that improves ideality. And that, in fact, is something inventive. Focusing a little bit on pleasure and pain. What do we mean by pain? Well, there's obviously physical pain, and since we're in the business of biomedical engineering, we're trying to alleviate suffering. We're trying to restore function. We want to alleviate stress, uh, both uh, physical stress and emotional stress. And there are numerous other types of pain, but it's, it's a general concept. Anything that's bad or costly. Pleasure, we refer, of course, to the five senses. Relief of stress brings us pleasure. Any type of uh, endorphin or opiate-like receptor response is, um, is pleasure. And then there are all kinds of psychological types of pleasure, wealth and power and uh, fame and fortune. In the parlance of biomedical engineering, we talk about quality of life. Let's look at a simple example from ordinary life, the vacuum cleaner. When we vacuum, it brings us some pleasure in that we have a clean house when we're done. It alleviates allergies and dirt and disease and makes everything look nice. But it comes with a cost. It's drudgery. It's time consuming. It's boring. It creates a lot of noise. So this gave rise to an opportunity to improve ideality with a new invention. And when this invention came along, it became extremely popular and made a lot of money for a lot of people. 
it brought the same pleasurable benefits, a clean house, no more allergies. It was also kind of cool. And as a result, people were willing to pay money for this invention because it alleviated the drudgery, the time consumption, the boringness. It isn't perfect, but the tipping of the scale of ideality is what made this invention so popular and so successful. Here's another example. A problem that exists in a large part of the underdeveloped world. Approximately 750 million people around the world still don't have access to clean drinking water. And many of them have to travel long distances from their homes to get it. In various cultures, women and children are typically the ones tasked with collecting water, often carrying the full containers on their heads. And studies have shown that significant risk to neck and spine injuries can result. So there's a limit to how much water can be carried. A non-inventive solution is, well, just carry less water and make multiple trips. That's really not improving the ideality. An inventive solution is shown here. It's a really brilliant invention, and it, it seems so simple, you have to wonder why no one thought of it sooner. And it kind of speaks for itself. It simply takes a water drum, turns it on its side, puts a hole through it, and allows you to pull up to 50 liters of fluid as opposed to 15 liters of fluid on top of your head. And this is making a huge difference in the underdeveloped world and one of the really great inventions of modern times in global health. A medical example involves three entrepreneurs who I met in 2007. They had a business plan for revolutionizing the oxygen concentrator. This is a device that's ubiquitous throughout the hospital and nursing homes and are typically very large, noisy, clunky, inefficient. And virtually every oxygen concentrator, although there were tons of them, were very similar, different variations on the same theme. They recognized that there was a need for an oxygen concentrator that wasn't as noisy and expensive and um, uh, large and um, bulky. So they discarded the existing paradigms. They started from scratch to define something that maximizes ideality, whether they realized it or not, to provide the useful functions and maybe improve on the useful functions while reducing all of those negative functions that people have just gotten used to living with. So uh, they retained the company I was working for and developed this device known as Inogen, or their company is called Inogen. The device, I think, was called the O3. And within a short amount of time, these three entrepreneurs were worth something like $300 million. And you can see on the right column, they received all kinds of um, excellence awards from uh, Frost and Sullivan and the MDDI, etc. So once again, the idea wasn't necessarily a brilliant breakthrough, but it was merely recognizing that the status quo was not acceptable and there was a better way to accomplish this same function with less negative consequences and providing uh, a better product. We're going to turn our attention now to TRIZ principle number two, one of my favorites and a very powerful concept in trees known as resources. Here's a definition. A resource is any substance or field, meaning energy, including waste, that's available to the system or its environment. Here we're using the word system very broadly, but I think you can kind of get the idea. It's generalizing any problem, any design situation, um, any um, use environment. The resource has the functional ability to perform additional functions. So it's, it's able to improve the system in some way. It's a latent, uh, it has latent value. So just some examples are reserve energy, free time, 
unoccupied space, information, and the list actually goes on and on. You'll read about that in the um, attached literature. I like this illustration. Have you ever noticed a large crane at the top of a construction site, at the top of a large building? Have you ever wondered how that crane got to the top of the building? Was there a larger crane that lifted the crane to the top of the building? How would you get a large crane to the top of a building if you didn't have another crane? Well, of course, you would use the crane because you have that at your disposal. It's a resource. It has value. It has the ability to lift things. So why not lift itself? It's somewhat hidden from view. You may not consider it, but there it is latent in the environment or in the system in which your problem exists. Here's another wonderful example of using resources effectively to solve ubiquitous problem very, very elegantly. The problem is according to the International Energy Agency, more than 1.3 billion people, that's 18% of the global population, lack access to electricity. It's both a health and a safety concern throughout the world. Along comes this award-winning product, which is so simple. It's a generator that comes in a bag. You take the generator out of the bag, and then you fill the bag with either rocks or with water and hang it on the generator. And then that energy, that potential energy of the weight of those rocks or water, operate that light for up to 25 minutes and can completely change the quality of life for a family living in one of those under-resourced areas. So I'd like you to think about other examples where gravity is overlooked and where it can be used effectively for free to solve other types of low-tech problems. Here's another example. Once upon a time, watches were not run on batteries, but they were run on springs. So you had to wind the watch once a day, and if you failed to wind the watch or forgot, you were late for your meeting or late for your class. Well, along comes this innovation, a self-winding watch. It involves a weight that's on a pivot that swivels around the center of the watch that when you're swinging your arms, when you're wearing the watch, it swings with your arm motion and through a ratchet mechanism actually winds the watch itself. So here, it's harnessing a resource. What is the resource? Well, it's the fact that the person wearing the watch is swinging their arms. They're expending energy. They're, they're producing a movement. So why not harness that movement to solve this problem without needing a battery or uh, external winding? When I'm preparing for this class, I'm super sensitized to resources and this is one that I saw one day. I pulled out my camera and took a picture because it, it emphasizes that something as simple as a surface can be a resource. And in this case, we have a power strip with this ubiquitous problem of never having enough places to put your power adapter. And in this particular case, the inventor recognized that there are surfaces that are underutilized. So why not use them effectively to solve that problem? I'd like you to also be sensitive to other surfaces that are underutilized, that could be put to some useful purpose. We'll talk about some in class this next week. Another advantage of paying attention to little clever inventions all around you is that you tuck them away in the back of your head and you can draw upon them when you need to solve a problem. This was a problem that was brought to me by a liver transplant surgeon. They needed to pass a catheter into the hepatic vein to interrupt the flow of blood for whatever reason. There's the catheter. The problem was that by inflating a balloon, which is the traditional way of blocking uh, a blood vessel or any kind of uh, conduit in the body, it, it created a pressure differential that caused the vessel to expand and thereby leak around the balloon. So I thought of the analogy actually, not of the water spigot, but of the leaflets of the heart and how 
these thin leaflets can resist so much negative pressure simply because they're floppy, they co-apt against one another and kind of behave like an umbrella. So I proposed something that looked like an umbrella. It was uh, less complicated, easier to deploy than that balloon. And similarly, when a pressure differential is placed across it, it actually expands and it gets more uh, embedded into the vessel as opposed to the balloon which allowed the vessel to leak. This also employs one of the inventive principles that we haven't quite gotten into yet used, called use the culprit. You'll see that again in a future class. Here's another quick example, grocery bags. I'm sure you've seen them. We bring home half a dozen of them, we throw them in the garbage, and uh, we treat them as waste. Well, here is a little clever invention whereby that same piece of garbage is now the liner to a garbage pail. It's using waste for a valuable resource and now obviating having to buy an expensive bag from Hefty, for example. Try to think of what else you could make out of a grocery bag. This one is really brilliant and I think a real illustration of uh, the inventiveness of using uh, resources. Have you ever seen these cooktops that never get hot to the touch but yet are capable of making water boil? How do they do that? Well some of you may know but those of you that don't, inside that cooktop is a coil. It's an electrical copper coil that induces an electrical current into the conductive material of the pot that electrical current then creates heat, and heat creates boiling water. So what are the resources? It's the metal from which the pot is made, its conductivity, and the opportunity to couple between an electrical current and the metal of the pot. Here's another quick example. I'm sure you've all seen these dust busters or whatever they're called, these handheld vacuum cleaners. This is a clever invention that capitalizes on that resource by adding a nozzle and a handle and turning it into a vacuum cleaner. The resource again is the, uh, the dust buster comprised of a vacuum cleaner, a battery, um, an airflow pad, all of the components that would go into a vacuum cleaner minus the handle and the nozzle. So using that resource, hybridizing it with a, a few extra components creates a, a new product. This is another example of a ubiquitous invention because this never existed. It was kind of waiting to happen. Then one company came along with the idea of this combination vacuum cleaner dust buster and then every vacuum cleaner company now has them. Yeah, this is a, a kind of a subtle example, but um, still trying to convey how vast and how um, pervasive this idea of resources is. If you ever use a dry erase board, you have a marker, you write something, and uh, invariably you make a mistake. You look around and there's no eraser to be found. So you wind up using your fingers or using a tissue or, you know, or improvising. Well, if you think about the resources available, well, there's the pen itself and the cap itself. So attaching an eraser to the cap of the pen does exactly what was invented probably a hundred years ago with the number two pencil with the eraser on the end and solving a very frustrating problem. One more example, the reversible jacket. Jacket has an inside and an outside. Using the inside as a resource allows you to create a new product by inverting the jacket and changing the color or the texture or the function. So to summarize, resources are of 
two categories. There's readily available and derived. Readily available resources are the ones that are obvious. They are the ones that can be used in their current form. And they are these general categories. Substances, solid, liquid, gas, waste, etc. Fields, such as gravity and magnetism. Space, volumes, surfaces, edges, points. Those are all resources. Time is a resource, the past, the present, the future. Information is a resource. And then actions or motions or processes can be considered resources, especially if they're useful, if they can be converted to a useful function. Derived resources are those that can be used after undergoing some kind of transformation or combination. They are also substances, fields, space, time, and functions. But there's also accumulation and concentration, which will become apparent in following uh, examples. Here's a very general, abstract illustration of derived resources. It involves a wire with, which has some kind of problem. Maybe a design problem. It might be a hazard problem. Um, it's kind of irrelevant. We don't want to be distracted. All we know is that the problem somewhere surrounds the wire. So we begin solving the problem by enumerating the resources. So in this case, it's kind of obvious there's the wire. There's voltage and current through the wire. There's air surrounding the wire. And what else? Well, the wire is comprised of copper. It may have some contaminants. It has a shape. It has a length. It has a diameter. The voltage and current may have some form of excitation. There might be a frequency involved. The air comprises hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon. There's temperature, both ambient temperature. There's air pressure. And then if you think even a little bit more abstractly, the current has a speed and a velocity. So if we were to combine some of those hidden resources, we can create um, derived resources. Resistance, for those of you that remember your physics, your electrical engineers, is a function of the resistivity of the material, its diameter, and the length. If we change the shape of that wire, we can induce a magnetic field. If we then bring copper contaminants in contact with oxygen, maybe with a little bit of temperature, we can form oxidation. Hydrogen and oxygen can cause water to form, moisture. And likewise, CO2 or carbon monoxide. Combination of that moisture with temperature and velocity might cause cooling or heat dissipation. So hopefully you can just bear with me with this abstract illustration to understand that this is a stepping stone to an inventive solution to this problem. You might be thinking that this concept of resources is so simple and obvious that it could hardly be useful. But let me give you this challenge. How could you use a candle to stop bleeding? Let's say, God forbid, you have a puncture wound through your wrist and you're bleeding through an artery. Well, let's look at the resources quickly because we're bleeding. The candle contains wax, of course. It has a wick, which is nothing but a string. It has a top and a bottom as an outer surface. It has mass or density. It takes up a certain amount of volume. It has a stiffness. The wax in turn has properties of slipperiness, density. It's made out of some kind of polymer as well as other resources. The wick or the string has a length. It could be fashioned into a shape and it can withstand tension. So we could combine that 
string with the stiffness of the candle to create a tourniquet. Isn't that clever? And is that something that was obvious at first? Or is it obvious now that we have decomposed the candle into its fundamental resources? Also, we can't forget that the environment also has resources. There's gravity, oxygen, nitrogen, and other features, temperature, etc., of the environment. And although it's not relevant to the problem, if we combine, let's say, the polymer, the wax that is made out of the candle, with, let's say, oxygen and an ignition, we can produce carbon. And with that carbon, maybe we can use that as a, a writing implement or for some other purpose as a derived resource. Here's an example that was brought to my attention by a friend of mine who happens to be an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. It involves a voice prosthesis that looks something like a bobbin. You can see it has two flanges. It has a central tube or web with kind of a duckbill valve in between. And the problem is that this has to go through a hole in the trachea, a tracheostomy. But obviously the flange is bigger than the hole. So how do you plan to get that big flange through that little hole? Okay, before I give you the answer, let's analyze this system. It's comprised of the patient, the trachea, and the, uh, the implant. Resources. So there's a patient, and the patient has lots of things going on, but for the sake of this system, it's comprised of the trachea, which itself is made out of cartilage, connective tissue. There's a hole in the trachea. There's surrounding skin. Then there's heat, and there's moisture and blood pressure in that environment. The implant, it's made out of some kind of plastic. It has two flanges. It has a certain shape, and it also has a flexibility. So the clever invention that capitalizes on those resources is to place a gel cap, it's a dissolvable gelatin uh, uh, capsule, around the distal end of that flange, in this case using a tool or with uh, fingers in the upper right hand image, inserting it into the trachea and then allowing the moisture and the heat to dissolve the gel cap, which then would cause the distal flange to deploy. And this is a patented invention and is making a lot of money for this company, Blom Singer. So here's what I believe to be the final example. It comes from the world of blood pumps that I know pretty well. And it illustrates how we get power into the body to, to energize um, implantable heart assist device. Typically done with a cable that goes through the skin and connects to an external battery pack. It's problematic because it involves penetrating the skin, which is a source of infection, which then is also a cause for mortality, morbidity. It's bulky and cumbersome, and it requires that you remember to charge your batteries, otherwise you can die. Nevertheless, it's the way it's always been done. Half a dozen companies solve the problem this way, and no one dares think outside the box. Well, along came investigators from Allegheny General Hospital that took advantage of a resource inside the body full of muscles. Muscles generate power. So they invented an artificial heart type device or a heart assist device that involves taking the latissimus dorsi muscle from the back, dissecting it, bringing it around through the rib cage, wrapping it around the heart, and stimulating it. And that skeletal muscle eventually is conditioned to become fatigue resistant and becomes a built-in endogenous heart assist device. There are various versions of this uh, in existence. Um, it hasn't yet gained a lot of traction clinically, but it's an elegant and brilliant example of using existing resources to solve a problem as opposed to a brute force solution applying 
existing uh, technologies and, and, and components. Okay, I lied. There's one more example. It's just so cool, I can't overlook it. It's a spin-out of Carnegie Mellon, and it was founded by a physiologist and a robotics engineer that devised a way of polymerizing fibrinogen, a very common plasma protein. They're able to make plastics, from rigid plastics to elastomers, out of this fibrinogen and thereby create materials that can be used as artificial tendons for skin, bone implants, a number of different uh, therapeutic uh, uh, materials. Along comes a surgeon and asks, why don't you just use the patient's own fibrinogen? In other words, take the blood out of the patient, extract the fibrinogen, return the blood to the patient, and now you have an autologous material that isn't from a cow or from another person, there is no issues of rejection, and you're using a readily available resource. So it's really a brilliant solution, using a patient's own blood to create a polymer that could then be used to replace a tendon, for example. The um, technology actually was spun out recently. The name of the company is called Carmel, which stands for or kind of evokes Carnegie Mellon. And they're um, in the news, and if you uh, Google them, you'll see that they're, they're growing steadily. And I think it's one of the coolest things that came out of, um, out of biotechnology at Carnegie Mellon. While we're on a roll, we're going to move on to a different kind of resources that I call enabling technologies. Technologies. What do I mean by enabling technologies? Well, there's a definition. I thought I made it up, but no, it's, it's in existence. It's on Wikipedia. And it's defined as an invention or innovation that can be applied to drive radical change in the capabilities of a user or culture. Enabling technologies are characterized by rapid development of subsequent derivative technologies, often in diverse fields. So it's like the, the key to unlocking an avalanche or a flood of new products or technologies. It's a close cousin to resources and uh, when uh, we delve into this further you'll you'll see why. It's most certainly something that's new, useful, and non-obvious. So an enabling technology is an invention and it leads to this this concept which is now uh, fashionable known as translational research of um, translating or transferring discoveries in the laboratory into something that's useful, that's, that's commercial, that can make a difference in the world. So there are many, many examples. Here's just a few. The, the CCD camera, super bright LEDs, the iPhone, Ziploc bags, x-ray, and the list goes on and on. I could uh, bore you with the list, but I want you to bore me with the list because it's part of your um, of your assignment. But the point is that each one of these technologies when they appeared on the scene um, created a, a whole series of derivative products and breakthroughs and technologies and inventions that um, that really made a, a big difference in the way we do things. I'm going to take a pause right now and get my daughter to stop uh, laughing. Okay, where were we? All right, so I want to just focus on one typical example without going into a lot of examples. Super bright LEDs. I can remember in my lifetime when these were brought into the marketplace, and I'm hoping that you're not too young to not remember when super bright LEDs became popular. Today, they're everywhere, and they've made a, a, a huge difference in energy saving, and uh, products that were just impossible before, like the these jumbotrons and LED TVs, for that matter, um, and um, the, that list goes on and on. In the car alone, there are LED lights everywhere: the tail lights, the headlights, the interior lights. Um, it's remarkable how quickly these super brights have caught on. This is before your time, but it's not before my time. 
I can actually remember when the first LEDs appeared on the scene. They were nothing but indicator lights, like you may have on your cell phone or DVD player. One of the first popular products that came on the scene were the LED watches. I remember my brother bought one of these, and it was exorbitantly expensive. My first calculator, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say, but it's the truth, was an LED calculator. I still have it. And as crude as it seems by today's standards, it was a huge breakthrough. Because before this type of calculator, um, you had um, old-fashioned adding machines. And it's just astonishing how far this technology has come in just a, a few decades. But um, it's interesting that the technology has a long history. It was in 1907 when the principle of electroluminescence was first uh, discovered. And it actually resulted in the first LED. It just so happens that the light was invisible and it was so weak that it wasn't good for anything. It wasn't until the 20s when different formulations of silicon carbide were tested to develop LEDs. And then the, the big breakthrough was in the 1960s when um, gallium arsenide was uh, introduced and that allowed for the first um, visible uh, LEDs. Um, this Gary Pittman worked together with Bob Baird to um, create uh, early solar cells. Then in 1962, the first really commercially useful LED uh, came into play because prior to this point in time, LEDs needed to be cooled in liquid nitrogen and uh, they just weren't very practical. So it was 1962 that the red LEDs came into existence, a decade later the yellow LEDs, and then in 1993 is when the first super brights appeared on the scene. Which leads to another point I just want to make parenthetically, that it's not just the introduction of the enabling technology that, that makes the um, avalanche of new products appear on the scene. Sometimes it's the expiration of the patent of that new technology. So the um, super bright light existed for two decades. Uh, and it was very restricted in its use, and it was licensed, um, if I'm not mistaken, to Bell Labs, uh, but don't quote me. It wasn't until that, that license expired that you saw the explosion of super bright LEDs el everywhere. And it's, it's kind of one of the reasons that it took off so quickly, because it had been incubating for so many years. That's where the priority date comes into play. So now you have to wonder, what could possibly be next? Well, it's, um, it even blows my mind that LEDs can be made into basically flexible paper. But it's here. These are called OLEDs, which stand for organic LEDs. And this is a technology that is here today, um, Although I personally have not seen a lot of products based on it, I would predict that in the very near future we're going to start seeing um, magazines and Kindle readers and all kinds of things. And it's one of the um, exercises I'd like to do in class on Thursday, is to try to visualize what we could use this technology for in the future. So here's just one example. The idea of using this flexible illuminator as an illuminated band-aid that could potentially be used to treat some kind of skin cancer is something that is enabled by this enabling technology. So we'll explore this a little bit further on. So I'm going to bring this right back to the TikTok Lunatic Multi-Touch Watch Kit, which is something that made a lot of money for these people and was an example of someone that recognized a resource, this iPod Nano, and recognized that it had the capability of doing all sorts of different things. So if you sensitize yourself that when a new resource comes on the scene or new enabling technology appears, try to think of what other enabling inventions that that may create and hence uh, offer you an opportunity to really capitalize upon. I want to circle back really quickly to the levels of invention from the first lecture. 
and point out that these enabling technologies are under the heading of discoveries, level five, like the liquid crystal display, an entirely new system that never existed before, and then gives rise to other levels of invention. For example, level four, inventions outside of a paradigm. So just again, be conscious of when these appear on the scene that they are very useful and powerful and could be potentially very lucrative. So you'll see this again in the, uh, the written material, um, and you'll you'll also I think revisit many of the concepts I just presented in Altschuler's classic historical lectures. There are six short vignettes; they're only a couple of minutes each, and uh, I find them fascinating. I hope that you will as well. So please watch those videos, uh, do the remaining reading, and then you will take the TRIZ quiz in preparation for our exercises um, next week. Thanks for your attention. Looking forward to seeing you in the near future.